You need this near-death experience, this mortality event, before you will open your mind to embrace a new idea. Um, I, you know, every time a politician wants to ban guns, there's an explosion in demand to buy guns, right? And so, uh, so talk about CBDCs really as a marketing event that causes everyone to think about a world where they don't own their own money. And that makes them think, well, what kind of money could I acquire that I would own? And the most censorship resistant monetary network in the world is Bitcoin. So interest in CBDCs is just going to drive more feverish interest in Bitcoin. It's, uh, it's actually uh, driving awareness and Bitcoin is growing as people become more aware that they need something which is non-sovereign, store of value, nation state resistant. So, uh, and if there's hyperinflation, people want Bitcoin. That's why they are thinking about Bitcoin in Argentina or uh, in Nigeria or anywhere in Africa right now. If there's moderate inflation, people that are sensitive to it will go for Bitcoin. And then the people that think the inflation won't go away will look at it as an oddity. <laughs> Um, but, you know, money is uh, it's, uh, a store of value, a, a unit of account, a medium of exchange, and then there's a fourth characteristic that we don't talk about. It's the, it's the thing that's not said. It's a system of control. So certain monies are easier to control than others. For example, you know, we, we talk about gold as money, but you ever try to carry um, a gold bar through an airport? Very heavy. Uh, yeah, try it next time. Um, you know, they won't let you through, right? In fact, if you tried to carry $100,000 of gold through an airport, not only would you not get through, but the assumption would be you're a criminal, you stole the gold, and they would just take it and keep it without a court order. Now, try to carry $100,000 of cash through the airport. Mm -hmm. You ever try that? Put it in a bag and just... Uh, you can put it in a bag, and as you're walking through the TSA check or the, uh, the x-ray machine, just nonchalantly say to the officer, yeah, I'm carrying $100,000 of money onto the airplane, right? You won't get through. Now, not only will you not get through, they'll just take your money, right? They'll just take it, and the assumption will be you stole it, okay? So cash is a unit of control. Now, put $100,000 in a bank, and try to wire it uh, to someone, or just take it out, and they're gonna ask you why. Tell them it's none of their business. <laughs> uh, try to send it to someone uh, privately. Uh, tell them you just wanna send it to a, a numbered Swiss bank account, right? See how that works. That won't work, right? Uh, that's a system of control. Um, a couple of sta stable coins have been getting shut down. Paxos' BUSD got a Wells notice. They got shut down. And Custodia tried to launch a bank, uh, and they wanted to issue AVITs. AVITs were digital dollars. And they were digital dollars that were going to circulate on crypto networks. And, uh, and the regulators denied that banking license. And it's about a 70-page denial letter, very articulate, and I read it all. I read thousands. I, I read all of the crypto uh, legislation and all of the crypto uh, litigation. So if you dig into that denial letter, which is very well written uh, and articulate, what is very clear is that is is the regulators say we're not going to allow the bank to form because we don't want to issue someone we don't want someone to issue digital dollars that will circulate on crypto networks non KYC what, you know evading our money law our anti money laundering rules our anti terrorism rules our, our know your customer rules so uh, it's clear that the regulators uh, reject with prejudice the idea that you can circulate large sums of dollars without reporting that. Now, that's a political football, right? Because a lot of people in this country think that you should own your own money and you should have financial privacy and you ought to be able to do what you want with your money. There's another group of people that don't agree, right? Uh, Ted Cruz is on the side of freedom. You ought to own your own money. 
Now, it turns out that um, if your money's in a bank, you're not going to be able to circulate it freely. It's controlled. Um, and uh, on the other hand, Bitcoin is the one network you can't control. Uh, you know, Ted Cruz's famous line is, I like Bitcoin for the same reason the Chinese don't like it. They can't control it. Mm. Nobody can control Bitcoin. Mm. So if you're, if you're insecure about being able to own your own money, do you own it? And can you actually use it without asking somebody's permission? Then uh, the solution is not gold, it's not silver coins, it's not stacks of cash, it's not money in a bank in the US, it's certainly not money in a bank in Lebanon, Argentina, anywhere in Africa. Those banks won't let you, they won't let you take your money out of the bank. <laughs> Go look at Nigeria, $42 a day, that's how much you can take out of the bank. They're keeping your money. So the one network uh, that you have that gives you a decent chance of owning your own money and then being able to spend it the way you want is Bitcoin. So I'm not worried about Bitcoin. I do think that um, there'll be a massive political fight over CBDCs. There's a technical challenge. Our government doesn't know how to issue a CBDC. We don't know how to issue digital currency. The people that are issuing digital dollars are the cryptocurrency mm. people, right? You know, Paxos knows how to issue a digital dollar, right? And the regulators sent him a Wells notice saying, shut it down. So the private market knows how to issue digital dollars. Uh, the government doesn't, the EU doesn't, the feds don't. And so even if they wanted to, they can't technically right now without somebody else's help. But as long as Congress is split, right, uh, it seems to me quite clear there's a large faction, uh, by the way, on the Democratic and the Republican side. I mean, Robert F. Kennedy, I don't think, is in favor of a CBDC, yep. nor is Ron DeSantis in favor of a CBDC. So there are a lot of free-thinking politicians in both parties that are adamantly against having a system of control where the government can decide how you, you know, it used to be $10,000 was the cutoff of the report, right? It used to be you had to report when you wired $10,000, and that was back when $10,000 was worth something, right? It used to be, I think it dates back, what, 30, 50 years or something? So it used to be $10,000 was a lot of money, and then they kept the, the $10,000 limit, and uh, inflation creeped up, and pretty soon $10,000 is, is not nearly so much money. And what we're seeing is uh, an encroachment of that, where now people are starting to lobby for the government to get a report on everything spent more than $600. You know, politicians have shown themselves quite capable of interfering in your private affairs, and, and the last three years have shown anything. They've shown that people can come up with some justification to tell you how many people can sit at your dinner table on Thanksgiving, right? And, and so there'll be some of them, I, I don't think that politically it's going to fly in the near term. In, in the next two to four years, I don't see consensus at the political level to impose a CBDC. But I think, so I think it's, it's like that persistent boogeyman where people say, oh, it's coming. And the result is, is uh, more interest in the antidote to it. So I, I, I don't think it's bad for Bitcoin. I think it's good for Bitcoin. I do think we ought to be concerned about money being used as a system of control is very disturbing. Well, I don't, I mean, to be clear, I don't expect it to happen. I, I, I don't think uh, that uh, there is consensus in the Democratic Party or the Republican Party to implement a CBDC. I don't think they know how to do it. I think there's resistance to it. Um, I, I think that what's going on right now is there's a regulatory crackdown on crypto. And so what, what, what is happening is the administration is, is cracking down on crypto exchanges. It's cracking down on crypto securities. It's cracking down on some of the crypto tokens and it's cracking down on cryptocurrencies. And by currency, I mean a stable coin, like a dollar circulating. And I think that that's uh, creating quite a, a lot of sound and fury and friction and anxiety in the industry. I think, uh, I, I think it'll continue. There is no coherent digital asset framework that's been offered by any regulator. 
There isn't any coherent digital assets framework offered by any legislator. We're nowhere near, that. like there's not a bill we're debating that if it gets voted on, we'll solve the problem. There is no bill. <laughs> okay, and so, the, you know, the talk about CBDCs uh, gets people, you know, quite spun up, rightfully so, but I think the story here is CBDCs are going to be a non-starter in the free world. And even in uh, the place that's closest to it is China, I suppose. And, uh, and so I, I really think that it's, uh, it's, a, it's a Chinese concept, and I don't really think in the free world we want to be like the Chinese. I mean, and I think ultimately uh, both sides of the aisle will agree on that. They won't agree on other things. They, they, they won't agree on private money. Like, for example, uh, probably the Republicans uh, and the conservatives would be in favor of private companies issuing digital currency and letting it circulate. And, uh, and on the other side of the aisle, they're a bit more conservative. And they, you know, they would say, well, we only want banks to issue currency that report to us on every material transaction. But um, none of the banks were able to issue a stable coin either. Signature Bank was unable to issue a stable coin. Silvergate Bank was unissu- uh, unable to issue a stable coin. And Custodia wanted to be an FDIC approved bank. They were unable to issue a stable coin. And, uh, and when you ask those banking executives, they said, well, the regulars wouldn't let us. I mean, it's, it, this is the struggle of, uh, you know, control versus freedom that's as old as time, right? And every society in, you know, in, the human, in the history of the human race, every society, there's always people that want to impose control on the people, and there's another group that want freedom. I, I've, been, I've been reading Conceived in Liberty, which is Mary Rothbard's history of the American colonies before the Revolutionary War, and it's hundreds of chapters nonstop struggle. Someone wants to control a colony. They want to tell you what to think. They want to tell you, you know, what, you know, who God is. They want to define religion. They want to impose taxes. They want to seize your property. They want to tax your property. They want to impose monopolies. And then there's another group fighting for freedom. And, and it was going on for hundreds of years before the Revolutionary War. I mean, there were monopolies in New York on who could bake, you know. They, they, there were tariffs on using the Hudson River to go up and down the river. There were monopolies on who could trade with the Indians. They would give you land, they would steal your land, they would tax the land, people wouldn't pay the tax, there were rebellions. It's hundreds and hundreds of struggles. So it's been going on before the revolution. It's going on in every country in the world. Today, it's certainly going on, and, and if you have any political power, I think the best way to use it is to support those that trust people are in favor of freedom, because there's, there tends to be, or seems to be, this never-ending tendency of governmental organizations to get stronger, and as they get stronger, they raise taxes, they funnel the taxes into the police state and the control state, and pretty soon, it's illegal to bake bread, it's illegal to row up a river. It's illegal to cross the river. It's, you know, if you have land, you have to pay tax. If you pay tax, it has to double. If, it, you know, the, the taxes were used, it used to be we paid tax to pay ministers to, to, to preach religious beliefs that you disagreed with. And if you, you know, if you actually laughed or kissed your wife on a Sunday, they whipped you. <laughs> You know, and find you and seize your property because you were disrespectful to the Almighty Lord. And, and I'd, I'd like to say it was uh, it was unique and a one-time thing, but it wasn't. It's it's kind of the history of humanity. So it's going on today. It's it's reprehensible, and you can't see politicians that will articulate that that message that the people cannot be trusted and the government needs to control everything. Luckily, we're in Florida, where we, where we have a number of politicians that believe differently. I'm hopeful that, uh, that we'll see a backlash to the control tendencies in the political sphere that have, have manifested themselves over the past few years. And uh, CBDC is just one of those touchstones. It's not the only one. It won't be the last one. 
wasn't the first one. I think gold's getting uh, demonetized by Bitcoin right now. Um, if you look at the past three years, since my, MicroStrategy bought $250 million worth of Bitcoin in August of 2020, since that time, Bitcoin's up about 140 uh, percent. The S&P is up about 20 percent. Nasdaq's up 10 percent. Gold's up 1 percent. Silver's down about 8 percent. Bonds are down 18 percent. Conclusion. Right. If you if you buy debt, govern, government debt, you're going to be bankrupt. That's why those banks are going bankrupt. All the banks had had debt when uh, the interest rates went through the roof. The debt traded down and they all were technically insolvent. Um, the problem with uh, gold is, first of all, if you have if I bought 250 million dollars worth of gold, I can't like carry it around in my pocket. I can't take self custody of it. I can't move it uh, anywhere. I can't transfer it to a counterparty. And so that means I have to put it in a bank. There's only a handful of banks in the world that custody it. And the banks rehypothecate the gold. So that means that um, if you wanted to sell $250 million of gold, the bank will, will sell your gold. If you want to buy it, they'll sell you paper. And the paper gold isn't backed by the actual gold. So <clears throat> you have fractional reserve banking of gold, right? That's that uh, you don't want to own an asset where the bank can sell a hundred x more of that asset than they own. That the whole problem with uh, fiat currency, right? If you look at the history of banking, it was, you know, goldsmiths. You know, goldsmiths have gold when gold was money, and they gave you a note. So you give me a million dollars of gold, I give you a million dollar note, you trade the notes back and forth, that's your paper money. That works fine as long as it's one to one. But then the guy that's the goldsmith says, holy crap, I actually can give him a million dollar note and he thinks that I've got a million dollars of gold backing it and now there's two million in the system. And then I give him a million dollars and now there's three million in the system. Now there's three times as much money there's one stack of gold worth a million bucks. Prices go through the roof. That's inflation. And eventually, you come back and you try to redeem your paper for the stack. I give you your gold back, and you try to redeem, and the gold's gone, and you try to redeem, and the gold's gone. Okay, I'm bankrupt. Oops. Okay, so uh, when did this idea of, of over-issuing paper money start? didn't start, a, you know, when Nixon defaulted on the gold standard, he wasn't the first, he was just the most famous, right? People have been defaulting on paper money probably for thousands of years. And Nixon just made it official. Yeah, so, so the issue is if gold is money and it goes into a bank, the bankers issue 10x more, more paper than there is gold. You have inflation. Eventually, right, when the French tried to redeem their, their paper dollars for gold, <clears throat> the U.S. basically closed the gold window. We defaulted on, on uh, that obligation, and we started a cycle of inflation from 1971 on that's been running 50 years. Now, when FTX failed, it was no different. The issue was people put Bitcoin on FTX, and then Sam turned around and issued 3x as much paper, you know, obligations. And when people try to withdraw the Bitcoin, he doesn't have it. He fails. When uh, Silicon Valley Bank failed, or when, when any of these other bank fails, they had a certain amount of money, you know, and then they turned around and they, and they invested it and uh, their investment was in government securities. The securities traded down. Now they were insolvent. When people try to withdraw their money, they don't actually have the money to pay them off. The banks fail. So when you look at this banking crisis, what's going on? What you've got is a bunch of banks everywhere in the world that have shaky assets, right? What, what's, what's really shaky? Well, if, if you actually hold Argentine pesos or, or Nigerian Nayara, and then you triple the supply of them every year, the value goes to zero, right? If that's your currency base or your asset base, you're <clears throat> going to be insolvent. When, pe when people put $10 billion into a bank backed by pesos, the peso goes to zero. The bank turns around and reloans out $20 billion. <laughs> now there's $30 billion circulating on $10 billion in the bank. 
When you try to withdraw the money, the bank collapses, the entire economy collapses. That's going on everywhere in the world. Uh, it's much worse in Lebanon or Nigeria or in Argentina than it is in the U.S. It's bad in the U.S., uh, but and it's cracking on the seams with, you know, First Republic Bank and Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank and and the like. But uh, what do you conclude if you're an individual? If you're just uh, if you're a company, or if you're a family, or if you're an individual and you live in Zimbabwe, what would you do? Well, you can't. You're not going to buy gold and put it in the bank. The bank's just going to seize your gold. You're not even going to buy dollars and put it in the bank. The bank is going to seize your dollars. You're not going to buy local Zimbabwe dollars. They're going to zero as you stare at them. They're going to lose 10% of their value a month, right? They're just melting in your hand. So you got to buy something you can custody. So before Bitcoin, you would have bought bars of soap crates of toilet paper, you would have bought motorcycles, you would have bought a Humvee, you would have bought barrels of oil, you would have bought anything, you would have bought food, you would have bought bullets, you would have bought guns, anything tangible that you can self-custody, you would have held. Now, after Bitcoin, you now have for the first time in human history, the ability to buy not a barrel of oil, but $80 worth of Bitcoin, and you put it on your phone, and now you can go through an airport with the Bitcoin. You can't go through the, air, through the airport with a barrel of oil, right? And, and you don't, what's the big, the big difference? The difference between gold and Bitcoin and the reason Bitcoin's up 140% and gold is up 1% is the middle class family can custody their own Bitcoin and a wealthy person can, can either hold $10 million of Bitcoin in self-custody, or if I live in Africa, I can move the $10 million of Bitcoin to Monaco, Singapore, London, Paris, New York, or Miami Beach. And that is not an option you have with your gold. It's not an option you have with your dollars. When you're an Argentine citizen, and you actually call up the bank and say, hey, move my million dollars out of Argentina and send it to Switzerland, they're like, <laughs> <laughs> Not so I got us. No, no, they have capital controls. They have banking controls. The, the people in Lebanon with millions of dollars in Lebanese banks, they wanted to get their money out of Lebanon. It was like, well, sorry, your funds are frozen. Why? Because the bank never had the million dollars. As soon as you put the million dollars in the bank in Lebanon, they turned around and loaned it to the government. It's gone. The government spent the million dollars. You try to get the money out. The bank closes its doors. Right? Is that illegal? No, because the guy that runs the government passed a law declaring a bank holiday for the good of the country, saying that we can't allow you to redeem your dollars. So, the bottom line is, if you're trying to use money that requires banks, you can't trust the banks. Right? You certainly can't trust the banks in Africa, in South America, and most of Asia. It used to be Americans thought they could trust American banks. Now they're realizing that they can't trust American banks. So the first order impact of the banking crisis is people think, well, maybe the money I had in the bank's going away, and so I ought to put it in a bank in cyberspace that isn't controlled by the government or by the bankers, and that's Bitcoin. The second order impact is the solution to the banking crisis is print more dollars. And if you print more dollars, the actual monetary inflation rate goes 10%, 15%, 20%. So you think, why do you think those bonds crashed? The, you know, because there are actually claims on dollars. Do you really want to hold a billion dollars of Zimbabwe dollars? What if I offered you 10 billion Zimbabwe dollars? I mean, the answer is it's going to a nickel. Okay, so if the, cur if the paper currency keeps crashing, then you can't own anything that's currency related. You can't own a currency derivative. You need to own something that politicians can't print more of. Okay, well, that's oil, that's land. But the problem is, try hauling 100,000 barrels of oil from where you are to London, where you want to be. How are you going to do that? 
I'll give you a billion dollars of land in Central Africa and then someone takes over with machine guns and declares that everyone with large amounts of land now loses it. That happened in Zimbabwe. You're going to pick up the land on your back and carry it to France? So it's kind of, it's simple. If people lose faith in the banks, they lose faith in the currency. When they lose faith in the currency, they lose faith in the government. When you lose faith in the bank, the currency, and the government, and someone says, what, do you, what can you trust? The answer is you can trust Bitcoin because you can custody your own asset, you can run your own node. And at the end of the day, even if the Chinese want to shut it down, they can't. If the Russians want to shut it down, they can't. If any nation state wants to shut it down, they can't. If the US wanted to shut it down, they can't. And so everybody wants something that they can trust that is beyond the reach of a corrupt politician, a corrupt corporate executive, or they don't have to be corrupt. They can just be well-meaning, trying to do the right thing in a misguided fashion. Money is a store of value, but, and there are multiple monies, and they're not created equal. So let me give you the world's worst money. The worst money in the world is like Argentine pesos or Venezuelan bolivars or Zimbabwe dollars or Nigerian naira. Weak money. That mo the, the official inflation rate in Argentina is 105%. But that's the official rate, which is, which is that understates it. The actual inflation rate would be higher. And if the inflation rate is wanting 100%, that means your money is losing half of its value every 12 months. That means that within 10 years, you have nothing. Okay, uh, so bad money, bad currency or bad money loses all of its value over the course of a few years. In Venezuela, you lose all your value in 36 months. In Argentina, in 10 to 20 years, the Argentine peso was one to the dollar 21 years ago. If you had, uh, if you had a million dollars 21 years ago, the Argentine peso right now is about 480 to the dollar. So that's not a 99% loss. That's a 99.8% loss, right? In, in how many years? 20. 21 years. Okay, so what I'm saying is you don't have money if you have weak currency. Now let's take strong currency. Well, the strongest currency in the world is the dollar. That's not money. You're losing 99% of your wealth over the course of 90 years in the, in the U.S. dollar. Maybe more. The U.S. dollar, the only difference between the U.S. dollar and the peso is whereas it takes 20 years to lose your family's fortune in the peso, it takes about 90 years to lose your family's fortune in the dollar. Right, uh, my, my house in Miami Beach was $100,000 in 1930. It was appraised at $46 million a few years ago. <laughs> Do the calculation. It's on a path to be worth $100 million, which means that the US dollar will have lost 99.9% .9 of its value over 100 years. Warren Buffett knows this, Charlie Munger knows this, basically, you're, the bottom line there is your money in the bank isn't money. Okay, so the answer is you shouldn't have any money in a bank, right? You're, you're basically losing 7% of all your wealth every year in a good year. If it's the dollar, you're losing 15% of your wealth in a not good year. If it's the dollar, you're absolutely losing all your money over the course of a decade. So that's that's kind of weak money, awful money is developing world money, the Lebanese pound. The Lebanese pound got devalued. I mean, you would have lost all your money in five years if you had the pound. The strongest money, decent money, okay money was gold, but not great. The strongest money in the world is Bitcoin because Bitcoin is absolutely capped at 21 million. It is global money. You could take a billion dollars of Bitcoin across a border. You can transfer it to a counterparty and no government can interdict that and nobody can inflate that. And so, so my, my answer there would be, you can't trust any bank. You can't, yeah, you certainly can't trust a bank in Lebanon. Read about Lebanese banks. You can't trust a bank in Africa. You can't trust a bank in Asia. You know, the, Bitcoin is a bank in cyberspace run by incorruptible software. It's going to keep your money 
If you are incompetent, then you're going to suffer the consequences. <laughs> but let, let's think about what, what banking executives in the U.S. do. The U.S. banking system is the best in the world. Here's what they do. You put $100 billion into the bank. They have the deposits. They turn around. The, the, the Federal Reserve interest rate, short-term rate, was zero. And these guys went and invested $100 billion of those deposits in, in mid-dated, long-dated sovereign debt that was yielding 1.8% interest. The Federal Reserve took the interest. But by the way, would you, ha would you loan me money for 30 years at 3% interest rate? Like, can you imagine that? If the inflation rate was 8 or 10%, would you loan money out at 3% interest rate for the rest of your life? Not in a million years. Okay, that's what the banking executives in the U.S. did. At the, sing at the point when, when the You're talking interest, about Silicon Valley Bank. All of them, right? P Signature, pretty much, all these guys. Not, ju not just the ones that went bankrupt, right? There's, there's a host of banks. I, th I think they had, what was it, like $800 billion of unrealized losses or something. A host of banks went and anybody that bought mid-dated or long-dated uh, bonds at the, you know, at the bottom of the market when interest rates were zero, they were loaning out money forever at 2% interest or 3% interest or 1.5% interest. And, um, and as soon as you redeem, what happened, of course, is the Fed raised interest rates from 25 basis points. Actually, the rates went from zero to 500 basis points in 12 months, about. That's the sharpest increase in interest rates in, in memory. That in itself is, I'm not gonna say what it is. It's, rep you know, it's just horrific, terrifying to think that any public servant would do that, but it's equally terrifying to think that if I was your money manager and if you had given me all your money when interest rates were zero and I, and I said, well, I guess interest rates will stay zero for the next 30 years. And so I'm going to loan it out as a bond and lock in a price of 2%. You know, you would have thought I was crazy. No, there is no individual, no, no corporation, no rational corporation, no economic actor that would loan money forever for 3% interest when inflation is running double or triple that. So the who question is, that? who would? And the answer is a bureaucrat, uh, uh, either a governmental bureaucrat, someone that is coerced by regulatory policy where they're forced to. For example, a bank can't buy Bitcoin, but a bank is almost obligated to buy treasuries. Right, so the politicians create a, a set of rules that strongly encourage you to do certain things and strongly discourage you to do other things. And generally, they encourage you to do the thing which is probably least economically viable. Yeah, so let me just answer two questions. What do I think will happen in the banking system and what do I think a person should do? What I think happens in the banking system is all of the regional banks you know, the small, mid-sized banks are at a massive disadvantage right now because the government is, is showing that they're not going to bail out those, those equity holders. So there's a, there's a migration of deposits from the small banks to the big banks. You know, I think that, you know, the JP Morgans, the Bank of Americas, the, the mega banks will continue. They'll be just fine. They'll be supported by the government. The small banks are going to struggle, and that's what, that's what you see going on right now. If you're a depositor, I mean, you'll probably get bailed out by the government. If you're a bondholder in the bank or an equity holder of the bank, you won't get bailed out, right? And so there's a crisis for investors, uh, whereas, uh, whereas everybody that's a depositor doesn't want to sit around and take the risk, right? I mean, who wants any anxiety? So I, so I think that to the extent that you rely on banks, clearly um, the world is waking up and the U.S. is waking up and they're thinking, I want to be with big banks. Uh, I, I wouldn't have my money in a bank anywhere outside the U.S. in a weak country, right? You, you, need, you need to be in a rich, strong country to, uh, with a rich, strong bank. With regard to what individuals should do, um, I, I think the, the logical answer is for expenses, if, if you have expenses in the next three months, 
you have your expenses in the local currency, which is the peso, the naira, the whatever, because it's legally obligated for you to pay in the local currency. For the next three years of expenses, or one to three years of expenses, you put your your wealth in the a strong, the strongest world currency in the world. That's the dollar right now. But you make sure that you have that currency either self-custodied or you have it in a bank that you trust. That's hard. <laughs> If you can't find a bank, if you were in Lebanon right now, can we trust you, man? <laughs> if you were in Lebanon right now, you wouldn't put your money in any bank. You would actually put it on the Bitcoin blockchain. For for any amount of money you want to keep the rest of your life, if you if you want to give it to your kids, if you want to actually retire on it, anything that's investable asset, you would put it in Bitcoin. You wouldn't put you would put it in a in the strongest possible world currency, the global the global money. And that's Bitcoin. You're not going to get rich investing in dollars. Do and you'll lose all your money if your dollars are in a weak bank. And if your dollars are in a strong bank, you'll just get poor slowly. And you're going to get poor. <laughs> you're going to get poor rapidly if your money is in not the dollar but a weaker currency. Mm -hmm. And you're going to get completely bankrupt if you trust a weak bank. And so MicroStrategy, by the way, has we had like 90 million dollars. We had four plus billion dollars worth of Bitcoin. So go figure, right? 98% of our assets are actually in the strong money. 2% is in the world's strongest currency in, the, in a good bank, in, a, in one of the big four banks, right? And, uh, and that's about as much exposure as I want to a currency. You know, you need this near-death experience, this mortality event, before you will open your mind to embrace a new idea. Mm -hmm. You know? Um, and if you live in Argentina, when you talk to Argentines, they say, my family has been completely bankrupted uh, twice in the past 30 years. Okay, so in, in South America, if you live in Venezuela, well, they've all been bankrupted twice in 10 to 15 years. Um, if you live in Brazil right now, I think the interest rates getting approached to four, approaching 14%, right? Money is hard to come by. And if you live in Africa, the Africans live under the CFA, uh, colonial franc, where they lose half their money every time they change currencies, and it's not convertible. And um, if you lived in, in uh, Nigeria, you know, you just ha you wake up one day and the bank says, you're only allowed to have $42 a day and if you live in if you live in India, that you know, you wake up one day, this press release that says, uh, all all rupee notes of ten thousand rupees or whatever above are now illegal, and you have to turn them all in in the next forty eight hours, or else they're null and void, and someone just invalidates the currency. If you lived in Russia in 1998, all the banks failed, and the ruble went to zero, and everybody lost everything. So I think that, uh, that people that live in other jurisdictions, if they've ever been completely bankrupt or seen their, their, their economy completely collapse, Sri Lanka, another good example, when that happens, then when someone says, okay, well, here's a bank in cyberspace and an asset that no one can meddle with and no one can, can corrupt or tamper with, you think, well, tell me more about that. But if you're, um, if you're a wealthy American, if you're Warren Buffett, you know, we, we have a very famous example, uh, a video that's going viral on Twitter. 13-year-old girl says to Warren Buffett, I'm really worried about the U.S. dollar as the reserve currency of the world. We're printing lots and lots of dollars, and if we're not the reserve currency, the value of the dollar is going to collapse. We're going to have hyperinflation. What should I do, Mr. Buffett? You know, and I, I wouldn't normally criticize you know, a, a, a respected, successful business person of his age. But he and Charlie Munger did choose to go up on stage and answer questions and give financial guidance and advice and investment advice, and they are looked up to. And so you watch Warren Buffett answer the question, and his answer is, well, yeah, I mean, I guess the Fed inflated the, the money, but they needed to. And, uh, you know, it's really difficult, you know, and politics have a difficult mm. problem. And yeah, you're right, it is a problem. And Munger will say, you know, the dollar's going to zero. It's going to zero. They know it's a problem. And then he kind of meanders through it with, a, with a, a, an end advice, which is, 
Well, you know, I don't know, but you know, America's a great country. Don't bet against America. But the, but the, but the, the blood-curdling, terrifying, you know, depressing, you know, takeaway from the clip is, is the 13-year-old girl knows what the problem is. The country's full of people that can articulate the problem and write thousand-page books on the problem. If you're rich in America, you don't have the answer because you're too comfortable, right? And so what you've got is a bunch of, of mega billionaires that are very successful in America, but they don't have an answer or solution to the 13-year-old girl. The solution to that question was Bitcoin, right? And Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger can't allow themselves to understand that because because they're so successful, they don't need to open their mind to, and embrace a new idea. If Warren Buffett woke up tomorrow and his bank seized all of his assets and they were devalued to zero, and he was a pauper, and his neighbor, the Uber driver, was walking around with $100,000 worth of Bitcoin on a hardware wallet, Warren would say, what is that again? Mm -hmm. Explain that to me. Yeah. What do you mean? My government, my bank can't steal all my money? That's a pretty good idea. Right? And, and so I, I think that when you're a refugee from fleeing Iraq or you're crossing the border and, you know, and when you try to go through an airport and a hostile regime steals all your money and seizes all your gold, when you have to flee your 1,000 acre or 10,000 acre farm in Africa because a hostile regime decided it was illegal for people like you to own land, when that happens, you become a believer in uh, a, a non-sovereign store of value crypto asset network, which is what Bitcoin is. The people that came to this country, the Huguenots, you know, the, the settlers, the, the colonists, I think they understood it. I mean, they had all their, all their property seized from them from wherever they came from. And their idea was, here's a place where I can own something and people might not steal it from me. As soon as they got here, people started trying to steal it from them again. Right? That's the human condition. Just slower. Just slower. <laughs> but that's why they kept going west. It's like, I got to go west where there's no politicians to steal it from me. Right? And, that, and that's a pretty powerful driver. So I think that the, that the conclusion is people that are comfortable, they're fat, dumb, and happy in the United States are going to continue to reject new ideas like crypto assets like Bitcoin, because they don't have to. If, if I don't have to embrace a new idea, when I get to a certain age, I won't. And that, that, is, that is as old as the, it's the, the Thomas Kuhn structure of scientific revolution. He said, paradigm shifts only get embraced in times of war or when the old guard dies. If you want to introduce a new idea, you need a war. Wars kind of work because if we're fighting a war and I introduce an airplane and I drop a, a nuclear bomb on your head, then you stop rejecting air power and you stop rejecting atomic weapons. You, you embrace the reality that, yeah, they do work and maybe you need to figure it out. Wars work, but absent a war, people just have to, you know, they just have to pass on because they're not going to embrace the new idea. If you, if you don't spend, first you have to have an open mind and say, is it possible that this works? And then second, you have to spend somewhere around 10 hours to understand it. I just don't think he has an open mind and I don't think he spent 10 hours, right? I mean, it, it's, not, it's not uncommon, right? People in their 80s and their 90s don't generally embrace the wonder that is the Unreal Engine or TikTok yeah. or, or, or Alibaba. Right? So, so it's, I, I, I wouldn't, again, it, if they were private citizens, I don't, I don't criticize private 80 and 90 year old octogenarians and, and the like uh, for not embracing the new cool thing, right? It, they don't have <laughs> to like, obvious, right? you don't have to like drone races, you know? It, you know, my, my father doesn't have to like drone races in his 80s. That's fine. Uh, but the point is, 
If you're going to tell people how to invest hundreds of billions of dollars or trillions of dollars, and you're going to give advice to a 13-year-old about how she can not be poor or not, or, or not starve to death, I, I think that then you have to actually study these things. And the elephant in the room is everybody in the world is facing inflation. Everyone in the world is facing counterparty risk. Everyone, everywhere in the world, we're losing faith in governments, banks, and currencies. The solution is a bank that isn't run by people, that isn't subject to the whim of a government, that is incorruptible, that allows you to be your own bank, right? And, and that is a message that's getting out. Uh, we just need to keep beating the drum on that. Uh, it, it is, I think, the most important economic opportunity slash issue slash technology of our time. I, I'm quite aware that that my impact is at the microstrategy level. I get to decide, you know, whether we're going to pay off a $205 million loan or not, right? I get to decide whether we're going to issue a billion dollars of equity or not. And I get, you know, so I have an impact over what microstrategy is doing as the chairman of microstrategy. And I have a responsibility to my employees, my shareholders and the like. So a lot of my work is there. And then I have the ability to have an impact and a need to to be engaged in the crypto economy. Hmm. So I'm spending a lot of time on Bitcoin, Bitcoin education, Lightning development of, of Bitcoin applications on the Lightning network, those sort of things, right? That's where I can have an impact. In the macro economy, I study it because I want to know what's going on with China and Russia and interest rates and hyperinflation in Argentina. But I, I don't, you know, I, I have uh, no belief that I'm going to be able to control that, right? Like, uh, I don't pretend to be able to direct Argentine macroeconomic policy. And with regard to politics in general, you got to pay attention to what's going on with, you know, the Tucker Carlson's of the world, and you got to pay attention to the presidential race and, and the politics, the Senate and Congress and the regulatory activities. But it's above my pay grade, right? If you look at my Twitter profile, I have laser eyes. And the, and the significance of laser eyes is if you want to make progress in this world, you have to focus and channel all of the energy you have behind a very, very particular objective. And I have one laser-like focus, right? Bitcoin is good money, right? Bitcoin is good for the world. Bitcoin is, is, a, a, is a global freedom, global property rights, Interesting. right? Like, I have a hundred other opinions, mm -hmm. but if, if I actually filled my feed with here's what I think about bicycles and here's what I think about diets and here's what I think about health and here's what I think about, you know, labor policy and here's what I think about states' rights and here's what I think no. about this country. At some point, uh, you just dilute your focus and you just, you don't have that much energy in this life. 92% of the people are dying of natural causes. 95% of the bandwidth, it, it bleeds at least. 95% of the bandwidth is the most colorful way to die, right? It's the, not the most likely way to die. It's the most colorful way to die. And so I, I think that all, all media is distorted and they're, they're all edited and they're all focused to a certain agenda. The only thing you can reasonably do is you can scan a bunch of them. You can scan, you know, your own Twitter feed will also be distorted. So you have to scan other feeds. And then you have to be continually going through this exercise in your head of saying, that happened, is it true? And then how significant is it? For, for example, Argentine inflation, 105%, is it true? No because the actual inflation rate is higher, it's, it's indicative of a truth. How significant is it? Well, how many people live in Argentina? That's one level of significance. The second is how much money's in Argentina. And the third level of significance is how, you know, how symbolic or, or how, how indicative or catalytic is it to other activity that will happen in the rest of the world, right? How symbolic is it? When you get to your 50s, if you read the same, like you read the same history book and you're reading it in your 50s, like, 
wow, I totally interpreted this differently when I was a ninth grader, right? When I was in college, I interpreted this differently. So you have to have real world experience. Oftentimes, you'll read a story and they'll state something and the truth is the exact opposite of what the story is. But you have to have lived life. Like for example, you read a headline, uh, we found 500 stone axes in a cave in Africa. They're between 1.2 and 1.7 million years old. Well, a school kid will say, oh yeah, so I guess they found some stone axes. I look at that and I say, well, there was a factory that made stone axes in Africa 1.7 million years ago. That meant that there was demand for thousands of stone axes a year. That meant that there was an entire civilization that existed, right? In fact, there was money, there was a government, <laughs> there was a furniture factory, there was a clothing factory, there was, a, there was agriculture, there was an entire society. You had to have 10,000 people all working together in coordination to justify having an inventory of 500 stone axes, right? And the only reason you actually read about the stone axes is stone axes is the only thing that's going to last a million years from now, right? And so what was there was a thousand X more interesting. The fact is there was an interesting higher level civilization with agriculture one and a half million years ago. They're not writing that in the history book because the literal historian only wants to report the bare minimum. But the reason that I could actually tell you a thousand other things is that I actually read books on Austrian economics. I, you know, I, I ran a business. I traded, I saw the, the, the meltdown and, and the, uh, the creation of dozens of, of industries, and I understand human nature, right? And so if you understand, you know, and you live the life, you're like, well, if I, you know, if I drink cartons of orange juice every day for months in a row, I know what's going to happen to me. It's not good. You can reverse that, right? And you can figure out what people ate 100,000 years ago. You know, you, they, they didn't do the things that we don't really think are good ideas today because they wouldn't have procreated through 100,000 generations. The, the time when you are most confident, when you have the most amount of formal education and the least amount of real world experience, like in your early 20s, right? Because you think you can do it better than everybody else and you haven't failed. And when you get another 25 years out, you're like, oh, I tried that, that didn't work. I tried that, that didn't work. I tried that, that didn't work. Oh yeah, that was a really good employee, but they quit because I was rude to them. Oops, I wish I hadn't done that. Oops, took that for granted. Bitcoin's never been hacked. So the, the, the only people that suffer with Bitcoin are people that trust their Bitcoin to the Sam Bankman Freeds of the world. If you put your Bitcoin in Celsius or BlockFi or FTX, if you, if you put it in, an, in a wildcat bank and the bank steals your money, right? It's, the, the real message of Bitcoiners is don't trust verify and be your own bank and not your keys, not your coins. So the message of Bitcoin is you can't trust anybody. If I, if, if I actually told you the world is made up of imperfect people and there, let's say there's a hundred families and we all have money and none of us trust each other and we all know we have idiot kids that are going to take over the family business and time and we want to create a community bank where we can collectively put our money, the answer would be, well, you don't put anybody in charge of it. You don't put any one family in charge of it. If, uh, you know, you might be the smartest amongst us and, you're, and your son's going to have an idiot me, son no. and eventually three generations down the road, it's not going to work anymore. So you write a piece of software. Everybody checks the software. We all agree the software is honest. We put the software on a computer. Nobody trusts your computer. We create a hundred computers. Everybody runs their own computer with the software. We all agree collectively not to change the software. And anybody that tries to change the software gets kicked out of the network. Mm. That's what Bitcoin is. It's, it's an honest approach to solve a problem when you can't rely on a person, you can't rely on a family, you can't rely on an institution, you can't rely on a government. What we rely on is the collective self-interest of rational people over time 
with regard to that one thing. And it, and it really is a beautiful invention. But I, I would say that any rational person that studied Bitcoin for 10 hours knows that there will never be more than 21 million Bitcoin. And so you, you know there's less than that because some millions of Bitcoin have been lost and they'll never be spent. And so you're buying Bitcoin because you know it's capped and you know that gold and silver and oil and soybeans and paper currency and land and apartments are not capped. Everything else on earth is going to keep increasing in supply forever. Bitcoin is not. So once you figure that out, then the only question is, is there anything better? And you sift through the other 20,000 cryptos. And if they're not better and they're not better, then this is the one. Now, every intelligent person with money has put their money on Bitcoin. So what are you going to bet on? You're going to bet on the networks that were invested in by people without money that aren't intelligent, right? So, so Bitcoin is the winner because the smart money has chosen it. There are a lot of other catalysts, right? Every time there's hyperinflation in a place like Argentina, it's a catalyst. Every time a bank fails, it's a catalyst. Every time someone builds an application that's cool on Bitcoin, right? Like all the ordinals and inscriptions and whatever, they're driving up transaction fees. It's a catalyst. Every time a company like MicroStrategy buys another $100 million worth of Bitcoin, it's a catalyst. Every time a regulator actually clarifies the fact that Bitcoin is a commodity, an asset without an issuer, and it's special, that's a catalyst. So lots of catalysts, they're all going to continue. The result will be Bitcoin will chop its way up with volatility forever. Just going to keep grinding up. Because for you to believe Bitcoin's going to grind up, all you got to believe is that human beings have a natural tendency to want to, uh, to improve their life and protect their property and, and, uh, and uh, benefit their friends and family. So Sailor is pro-freedom and pro-markets, and Saylor, believe, he's an Austrian economist, so all value is subjective. So here's what I think. I think everybody should be able to launch whatever business they want to launch. And I think uh, everybody should be able to pursue, pursue uh, their happiness however they want. And I think that lots of people will create lots of things that won't work. So I'm not going to give you a recommendation of stocks because some businesses will work, some won't, and some stocks will, you will buy too high and some you will not, and I don't want to be on the hook for 10,000 stocks. I'm not going to tell you how to gamble, but I'm not going to tell you not to. I'm not going to give you a recommendation for a private business. You want to collect art? I, you know, I'm not going to tell you not to. I'm just not going to tell you which piece of art to buy to make money. I don't know which, uh, which thing is going to work, and I know that over time, all, all fiat currencies will fail, and over time, I believe most businesses, in fact, all businesses will not be as good as investing in Bitcoin because Bitcoin is the low-risk asset. I do think that uh, what happened uh, over the past uh, five months is pretty interesting. If you go to New Year's Eve, um, the average fee on the Bitcoin blockchain was like three sats per v byte I mean, there were blocks every 10 minutes that had 600 dollars of transaction fees in them right and so the miners were getting a reward of a hundred thousand dollars with 600 dollars or 300 dollars of fees so the fees were one percent of the reward yeah. there were nothing de minimis <clears throat> and and what happened over five months is Bitcoin had a massive rally. All of a sudden, the miners were getting a $150,000 or $200,000 reward. But then we saw fees, transaction fees that got to more than six Bitcoin, which was $180,000 in fees. So we went from $1,000 in fees to $100,000 in fees, a factor of 100 increase. And uh, the fees started to approach parity with the reward. If you're a, uh, an investor in Bitcoin mining, if you're a Bitcoin miner and you want a bullish thesis, in order to have a bullish thesis, you want to see that fees, transaction fees, are at parity with the rewards. And you want to, then you want to, to have a, a belief that transaction fees will increase at a rate faster than the hash rate. So if the hash rate's going up 20% a year and transaction fees are going up 30% a year, then that's a good business, a really good business. 
And, and so in a world where transaction fees are 1%, they, they're irrelevant, you don't have parity, and then the growth rate doesn't matter, and then all you see is the rewards are decreasing 18% a year, and that's a bearish scenario. Uh, so I think that what, what happened with ordinals and NFTs is we crossed this chasm from what was a bearish scenario to a bullish scenario. If I was a miner, I would be ecstatic. You know, if you, had, if you wanted to move $10 million of oil from New York to London, it would cost you about $350,000. So what if I want to move $10 million of Bitcoin from New York to London? What if I want to move $10 million worth of a document of something of... If you wanted to sell a $10 million work of art, that's $500,000 to a million or more in auction fees. Mm -hmm. so, so people have thought, well, transactions, man, they, they, there's no future for them. But I actually am of the opinion that transactions at a dollar or two dollars transaction, they're very undervalued. This is the most valuable, most tamper-proof, immutable, secure transaction network in the world. If I gave you a hundred billion dollars and I said attack the network, you couldn't do it. If you were a nation with a hundred billion dollars and four years, you could slow it down, but you couldn't stop it. So I, I think that the real significance of ordinals and NFTs and inscriptions is people used to take the transactions for, for granted and they undervalued the Bitcoin mining network. And now I think what you have is a lot of speculation and you also have, um, you have a migration of crypto development energy from the other cryptos to Bitcoin. That's a good thing, I think. It's, in very, it's, it's inevitable because Bitcoin is the low risk crypto network and the high security crypto network. So, so you're gonna see speculation move, you're gonna see development move, but, um, but long term, what's really significant here is that people are going to see Bitcoin as the most secure cyber network or the most secure computer network in the world. And if I told you I'm going to burn a document and I want it to stay immutable for a hundred years and I don't want any hostile corporation or nation state or actor to be able to tamper with it or stop it. And in a hundred years, I want to prove that that's my document. You know, Satoshi could sign a digital document. He could sign a message today and prove that he owns $30 billion of Bitcoin and he could do it in a split second. That's the power of the Bitcoin network. And that has been under-realized. It's, uh, it's underestimated. So I think that what, what's gonna go right now is it's gonna be a lot of excitement, but ultimately the ethically sound, technically sound, economically sound future is for people to realize that Bitcoin is this immutable, you know, incorruptible, non-sovereign, computer network and it's going to protect your money but it's also going to protect your integrity and people are going to pay money for truth on that network and that's what's going to finance those miners and when you look at all those miners running in texas you're saying what are they doing they're protecting the integrity of western civilization maybe of all they're protecting the integrity of the human race for the next thousand years I think that the number one criteria uh, to run an organization, you know, is humility combined with a bit of wisdom uh, from life experience, but combined with an extraordinary amount of, of energy. You, you know, you, you have to eat, sleep, and breathe the thing. <clears throat> and I think that organizations that have um, that have people with too much confidence, they tend to go off the rails. And so it's, it's good to know what you don't know. Okay, if you, if you don't remember anything else I said today, just remember uh, Bitcoin is hope. <laughs>